Obsessed with celebrity, his role models serial killers. With Susan Sarandon's stolen necklace, Sidney hatches a diabolical plan to achieve his ultimate fantasy. Trophy Kill, The Shall We Dance Murder, The Trial and Revelations of a Psychopathic Killer. On July 1, 2003, the Miramax movie Shall We Dance, starring Jennifer Lopez, Susan Sarandon, and Richard Gere, was being filmed in Winnipeg. The next day, Sidney Tierhuis walked into a police station claiming he had awoken from a drunken blackout to discover a man dead in the bathtub, maintaining he had no memory of the killing. Police discovered the victim cut into eight pieces, decapitated, disemboweled, sawn in half with all of the internal organs missing. The dismembered and mutilated corpse was posed, crudely reassembled, with Susan Sarandon's gold necklace found a few feet away from the murder horror spectacle. Through a fateful turn of events, journalist Dan Zupanski has an opportunity to correspond with the killer. He gains his trust and is eventually sent a series of shocking letters and diagrams outlining every graphic and horrific detail of the murder, organ removal, and sex with the corpse. Dan contacts authorities and is suddenly thrust into the trial as the prosecution's star witness, testifying against the killer, desperate to see him sentenced to life in prison. Prosecutors have the burden to prove Sidney had the necessary intent to kill. If they fail, Sidney walks the streets again. Discover the incredible role that Susan Sarandon's stolen jewelry had in the motive for one of the most horrifying murders of all time. Uh, good evening. This is your host, Dan Zapansky, for the program, True Murder, the Most Shocking Killers in True Crime History, and the authors that have written about them. Now, I'm using this program as an opportunity to promote my upcoming book, uh, my first book. Uh, this book is about Trophy Kill, The Trial and Revelations of a Psychopathic Killer, The Shall We Dance Murder. I'm going to explain and unfold the story to my audience tonight. I have seen over the past programs that there have been some telephone callers. I don't want to be ignorant or anything, but let's wait till about half an hour, 35 minutes. Wait till we have this story unfold. Gather your thoughts and your questions, and I would be more than happy, believe me, to answer any one of your questions. But please sit back and listen to this incredible story. I'm sure that you haven't heard this story. If you have heard something about this story, wait to hear all the details. Now, this story starts in Winnipeg, and Winnipeg is in the province of Manitoba in Canada, um, near North Dakota, South Dakota, near that border, for those uh, of listeners in the United States. Now, Winnipeg, Manitoba, this is July 1st, 2003. And the Miramax movie, Shall We Dance, starring Jennifer Lopez, Susan Sarandon, and Richard Gere was in Winnipeg. July 1st happens to be our Canada Day, the American equivalent of July 4th. And a man named Robin, Robert Green, Jr., was in Winnipeg, and he was visiting from a reserve a native reserve called Shoal Lake, Ontario. And this is about a couple hours' drive east of Winnipeg, just the other side of the Manitoba border. And for those of you who don't know, Winnipeg is about 700,000 people, about the size of Seattle, Washington, or Seattle, pardon me. And Seattle, however, is much bigger, as are many American cities, in their metropolitan area, the suburbs. Whereas we... Certainly, we have people going out to the suburbs and and uh, and building and living out in those suburbs, but we have about seven hundred thousand people in our city primarily primarily now anyway, this gentleman robert Robert Green was a thirty eight year old aboriginal man and uh, he wanted to visit Winnipeg he 
want to visit Winnipeg for the Canada Day festivities and also to visit his sister, apparently. Now, Susan Sarandon on July 1st, uh, her and her assistant were in a, tra- a trailer and they had just changed some clothes after having filmed some scenes in the movie. And uh, Susan Sarandon had been in Winnipeg for almost two weeks. She's finding the city very enjoyable. She had uh, frequented some restaurants, shopped in some boutiques, and he had even gone to a baseball game. Now, Susan, uh, on this July 1st, and the gold necklace, by the way, is she wears this necklace in the movie. It's a gold necklace. It looks like an older necklace. There have been various reports that this is costume jewelry. However, it's very expensive jewelry. Uh, they have they listed the price at about four thousand dollars. Now, if she removed her earrings, her engraved silver bracelet, and her antique looking at least gold necklace with pendant, and uh, her assistant was there, and they put the jewelry away, and they left the trailer. Now back to Robin Green. He was out near the area, and he came upon uh, a bunch of people assembled behind a barricade. And what he came upon was the movie set. They were doing some outdoor outdoor shots, and there were a bunch of fans uh, looking, celebrity watching, trying to get a glimpse of Richard Gere or Susan Sarandon. Uh, Jennifer Lopez was the star of the movie. However, Jennifer Lopez wasn't in the city as of yet. Uh, she was not to arrive in Winnipeg till about the 4th of July. Anyway, uh, Robin, Robin Green, Robert, pardon me, Robin, Robert Green um, hung around for a little while with the group that had assembled around this barricade, trying to get a glimpse of one of the stars. They didn't. Nobody got to spot anybody, and so he walked north about two blocks or so, two or three blocks, and lo and behold the actor's trailers were set up. And for some reason, and we'll get into this a little bit later, the security wasn't there, and security never spotted him, and he went into probably the biggest and best-looking trailer, looked around and quickly found the jewelry, and headed towards Main Street. Half an hour or so later, and because the movie set was set up by the legislative building on what's Assiniboine Avenue, and he wasn't maybe 15 minutes. He was near the forks, uh, and he was maybe 15 minutes away from his destination. And so he went north, headed to Main Street, and went into an old established bar called Woodbine Hotel. And according to, and a lot of this story really is is from the killer himself, but needless to say, uh, Robin Green went from table to table trying to sell Susan Sarandon's gold necklace, one of the pieces of jewelry he had stolen, and for $15. And Sidney Tierhus was sitting in the Woodbine. Woodbine is one of these bars that opens like 9.30 in the morning. It's, uh, uh, put it nicely, it's a a hardcore bar. It's uh, it's a decent looking place, but it's, you know, it caters to a a pretty dedicated drinking audience. Hence the hardcore. So, Robin Green was trying to sell this gold necklace for $15. Sidney Tierhuis was approached by Robin Green. They got to talking. Um, Sidney Tierhuis is a self-avowed bisexual. Robin Green and and Sidney Tierhuis agreed to go back to Sidney's hotel, which was about a block away, called the Royal Albert Hotel. And he had rented this room. He had been in Winnipeg for about three weeks. He had lived out in Vancouver for quite a while, and Edmonton as well. He worked as a chef. Sidney Tierhuis was an Aboriginal as well, 33 years old. However, he had been adopted by a white family, a Dutch family, in Winnipeg and taken from a small reserve, Little Grand Rapids, in northern Manitoba when he was just a small child and adopted into the white family and raised by this family. Uh, adopted and raised by this family in Winnipeg. Then he moved out to the West Coast, became a chef, and spent about 10 years out there. So anyway, Robin Green, Sidney Tierhuis, go back to the hotel. They have some uh, homosexual sex, some oral sex. 
they drink some alcohol. Uh, that was the premise that uh, Sidney had invited him back to the room for some drinks. Now, July 1st, this was a really hot day, exceptionally hot day. Um, it was very nice, sunny, not a cloud in the sky, warm day, very warm day. And this is a, a, a old hotel built in about 1913 with no air conditioning, so it's quite hot. Anyway, they stayed in the room for a little while. They took some photos, and Robin Green had brought, taken out the gold necklace and put it around Sydney's neck, apparently, and they admired it. Uh, Sydney realized it was uh, definitely a woman's necklace. Anyway, they decided they should go for a walk, pick up some beer, go outside, sit by the river. So they eventually walked and made their way back to Assiniboine Avenue, and for those listening, Assiniboine Avenue was where the Shall We Dance movie was set up. It was further down from the park that they ended up being at, spending a few hours in the afternoon. Whoever was just down the street from the Shall We Dance movie set outdoor location and all the hullaboo, hullabaloo involved with that and all the fans vying to see their star celebrities that they were interested in seeing and the police were there, and of course security. These are big celebrities. So anyway, they stayed at the park for a little while, and then they came back. And uh, they talked to the bartender. I was one of the only witnesses at the trial that actually spoke to them. And apparently Robin Green was staggering, drunk, very intoxicated. Robin, uh, pardon me, Sydney seemed to be fairly normal. They bid their the goodbyes to the bartenders. Sydney wanted to go downstairs and get some ice. He asked the bartender to watch him for a second. He introduced him. They went upstairs, and the story uh, ends for the time being. Now, the next morning, July 2nd, now, I, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, of course, once the jewelry is stolen, Susan Sarandon and her assistant notice that the jewelry is stolen and, of course, call police. So police are called to the Shall We Dance movie set on July 1st concerning the theft of some jewelry. And on July 2nd, around 9.30 a.m., Sidney Tierhus, thinking that he is walking into a police station, actually goes into a remand center, which is a a holding center, basically a jail, um, a little bit different than a police station. This is where somebody would go in to visit somebody that was in, was in custody awaiting trial. So he walked in and asked to see someone, and he said, what's about? I, well, I just want to talk to someone. He seemed to be very, very calm, cool, and collect. Uh, no signs of anything amiss. Asked to see someone, uh, a senior officer named Donald Steenson, came up from the back and said, what's this about? They went into a back room, and he said, yes, can I help you? And he said, well, I just, I just came in because I've killed someone. And he said, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, hang on, don't tell me this, I'm not the kind of guy you should be telling this to. And it totally caught him off guard because this is not, you know, this is definitely not something that... Uh, he would expect, being that it's a remand center and not a police station, certainly. Even a police station, this is not. This is completely out of the ordinary. Anyway, he walked in, he said, you know, I would like to speak to someone. And and guard came out from the back, Donald Steetson, like I said, and he said, can I help you? And he said, matter of fact, I found a body chopped up in my bathtub. I've turned myself in because I've killed somebody. And this is really matter of factly. He said, don't say another word. I'm not the person you're telling this to. He handed the phone to Sydney, gave him the number for the public safety building, the actual police station, and instructed him to call. Now, the operator on the other line, my name is Zupansky. This woman's name, ironically, is Robin Zubansky. Anyway, she answered the phone. Winnipeg Police, how can I help you? And Sydney calmly replied, my name is Sydney Tierhus. And I killed someone yesterday. She asked, how'd you do it? I chopped up the guy. I blacked out. When I woke up, I found the body in the bathtub. So she asked what type of weapon he, 
did he did you use to kill the victim? He says, I used a knife. Where's the knife now? I left it on the floor of the bathroom. Where did this occur? The Royal Albert Arms Hotel, room 309. And where are you now? The remand center. She said, sir, police officers are on their way. Now, two police officers come. Um, Officer August Marin and her, his partner, Sylvia Schroeder. And uh, he'd been a cop for about eight years. She'd been a cop for about four years. And they walked into the facility, saw Sydney sitting on a small couch close to the entrance, and asked him to explain his story. So besides what the two officers had already been informed of by the 911 operator, Zabatsky, Sydney told him that he had met the victim, they'd gone to his room for drinks, and this seemed odd to me, consensual sex, and eventually had passed out intoxicated. When he woke, he went to the washroom, and in the bathtub was a dismembered body. Now, I never gave any more details to these officers, and the three of them proceeded to the Royal Albert, Royal Albert Arms Hotel in Sydney's room. So, the hotel was not very far, and they arrived there in a few minutes. Um, this is, a, like I say, an older hotel uh, built in 1913. Now, it's 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 a sort of a mainstay for punk and hardcore metal bands to play in the in the in the bar in the basement caters to its uh, low income uh, clientele in the hotel itself and so maybe you get the picture uh, another cop joined them at the hotel and the three officers in Sydney that they went through the front entrance past the uh, bar room up the elevator into the third floor now uh, they asked him for the key, and he handed it to him. And Officer Marin opened the door and walked in first, and his partner, Officer Schroeder, followed. And Constable Beach, he remained in the hallway with Sydney. Now, it was an incredibly small room, and it was uh, beer bottles all over the place and a bunch of pairs of blood-stained underwear. Now, female Officer Schroeder found a bed sheet on the floor covered in blood, and the mattress had several seemed seemingly deep knife cuts and was soaked with blood. Now, there was blood splatter all over the wall by the bed and the wall leading to the washroom. Now, Marin quickly completed looking about this little room, like I say, and proceeded to the washroom. When he pushed open the door, he froze. In the antique clawfoot bathtub, Robin Green was displayed, lying on his back, facing the doorway. He had been dismembered and posed crudely reassembled. The decapitated head, with long, straight, coarse black hair, sat atop the neck and torso. One of the eyeballs was gone and the other punctured. The mouth was frozen wide open. Now, the body was sawn in half at the waist. The severed forearms were positioned close to the elbows, as well as the severed legs, which had been cut cleanly, surgically, just below the knees. Now, the penis and testicles, again, were surgically removed together and placed where they would be normally. The chest had dozens of steep stab wounds, uh, and it was carved in a figure-eight pattern. Right nipple was cut off, and the right forearm and the hand were partially dissected. Now, at the same time, simultaneously as he's seeing all of this, there was one huge cut from the neck clear to the waist, and the chest and abdominal cavity were completely empty. Flesh hung from the two rib cages. The skin's color was gray. All of the internal organs, the intestines, everything that normally would have been in a body was gone. There was no blood inside the cavity or on any of the body parts. Now this officer Marin, he stood there for about two or three minutes. He couldn't move. He, he, he stood there transfixed. He couldn't move or say anything. His mind could simply not process what he was witnessing. Despite the fact he had grown up in rough and tumble Winnipeg, Despite his extensive police training and almost eight years working the streets of Winnipeg, and this is the murder capital of Canada, many years running, despite having been told by Sydney that there would be a chopped up body in the bathtub, 
the scene, this scene, was overwhelming. This big, strong, tough, and trained veteran officer found himself short of breath, tight chest, sweating, shaking, and needing to vomit. The sight and smell of the rotting corpse, surrounded by a horde of flies, began to finally snap him back to reality. Initial shock turned to cold, hard recognition, and then finally, revulsion. He finally stumbled out of the washroom, to the main room, and then out quickly into the hallway. He tried his best to compose himself, steadying himself in the doorway, trying to catch his breath, and finally told Officer Beach, cuff him, and he did. Referring to... Referring to the washroom, he told his partner, don't go inside there. You really don't need to see that. And Officer Marin locked the door and gave the key to Officer Beach so he could remain, keeping the room secure. Now the two officers, Marin and Schroeder, walked to the elevator and traveled downstairs to the lobby and then outside to the police car. Now Officer Schroeder placed Sydney in the back seat and then she was concerned. She asked her partner, are you okay? And the guy was shaking, and the officer had wiped his, the tears from his face and replied, No, I'm not. Not after seeing something like that. So the three of the, them, um, she had called headquarters to report the murder and uh, asked if he wanted to contact the lawyer and said he did. The coroner's van pulled up, and the Crown Victoria police car showed up shortly after that. Uh, four crime technicians, the coroner, and the two cops entered the hotel and went to three, uh, room 309. Uh, there had been a crowd that started to gather almost immediately outside the hotel. Uh, CTV News showed up shortly after that and a couple of the other news agencies. And it's almost like with the news agencies came all the curious onlookers. Someone was even heard asking if the scene was being filmed. There's so many movies in Winnipeg, they thought it was being part of a movie. Now, Sidney Tierhue sat uh, handcuffed in the, in the police car. Nobody even noticed this guy. Um, he was there for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, three of them then proceeded to the public safety building. The crime scene investigators searching the room, however, had discovered Susan Sarandon's stolen gold necklace in the midst of this whole murder horror spectacle. Now... How I came to this story and my involvement is a central feature of this book. Um, when I first became involved with this, I'll give you a little bit of the background, but uh, when I first heard about this, I had arrived back in Winnipeg. I'm originally from Thunder Bay, Ontario, about 500 miles away from Winnipeg, uh, east. And uh, anyway, I arrived back on the 4th of July after spending... Canada Day in Thunder Bay, and I saw the Winnipeg Sun newspaper with the headline, Victim Cut in Pieces, Stolen Film Jewelry, and Bizarre Tale of Murder. And in the subsequent days, I saw the murder dismemberment story make the front pages, and then on July 12th, Sidney Tierhuis, again on the front page, this time with his smiling face in the headline, I am not a monster. And inside, there's another caption, I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. And the headline in the paper on page three was, Royal Albert Hell, Accused Killer Has No Recall of Grizzly Events. Now, I read the story about the gruesome murder and the statements made by Tierhus, and saying he had passed out and he had no memory of the killing. I was doing a radio show since 2000 called Off the Cuff, and I had the freedom to be able to interview anybody about anything I wanted. I was sort of an open format I came up with. It was a one-hour weekly program live, and um, so I could handle some controversial topics. Uh, about a couple years in, and I had been in Winnipeg only about, at that time, uh, about six or eight years, but I was very uh, dismayed by the, the kind of stuff I was reading in the newspapers. Some of the most bizarre crimes in Canada are occurring right in Winnipeg. It's a, Like I say, it's the murder capital of Canada, many years running by far, and so there are some serious problems here, and we won't go into that, but suffice to say, it is the murder capital. Anyway, I had been involved because I had read about a group, uh, a gentleman who had lost his son to a, 
another person and he was uh, dutifully outraged with the Canadian laws and the leniency and uh, seemingly the uh, coddling of criminals. Uh, it's incredible compared if you looked at other jurisdictions like the U.S. It's night and day. Apparently we have the same basic judicial system, but you wouldn't know it. Anyway, he, he formed a group called People for Justice. And basically what we were talking about was uh, dealing with the serious crime, the rape, uh, murder, um, you know, official pedophiles, certified pedophiles, the most serious crime, violent criminals. So we were talking about the most heinous criminals, most serious criminals, and then critical of some of the things like concurrent sentences. Um, instead of a consecutive sentence, say for three murders, you would get a 25-year sentence possibly for three for each murder, which would enable you to have 75 years. So in effect, you can't get a, you will never be able to be released on parole, even if anyone wanted to let you out. In this country, we have we don't have that. We call it concurrent sentencing. So three murders counts the same as one. That's just one of the myriad of problems that we have that the group was critical of. And again, some of the leniency and some of the, uh, it's just a completely different system. And so I was a very vocal critic and was involved with People for Justice as a uh, chairman of media and policy affairs. And when I saw this story, it looked like an incredible example, again, of a guy that does, he's Jack the Ripper and beyond the removal of all the organs. And then, you know, the police never found them, ever. So they were missing now, the body was posed, reassembled, like some kind of, well, it's hard to describe. It's a scarecrow. I mean, it, it's definitely for effect. Now, the jewelry is not too far away. It's not hidden. It's, it was not too far away from the entire crime. It's right there. And he walks into a police station and says, uh, nonchalantly, hey, you know, I, you know, I killed someone, but hey, I was drunk. I passed out. When I woke up, I saw the crime scene. I can't remember anything. Now, for again, for people that are listening, you're going, yeah, but still, it's an open and shut case. Not in Canada. As soon as alcohol is involved, it diminishes the responsibility of the person. And many, many times, and it's under many circumstances, somebody who has voluntarily consumed alcohol will have that as more than a mitigating circumstance. It lessens the murder charge from second-degree murder to manslaughter. Now, manslaughter allows for a life sentence. However, what's called precedent, and it's a precedent where the courts say they have to follow this ever-increasing precedent of leniency, they come up with if it was 10 years for one person, 10 years for another person, similar circumstances, it just seems that the sentences always get less and less. So maybe manslaughter would be 10 years. In Canada, after two-thirds of that sentence, you're released mandatorily, unless there is some major problem. There is the ability for parole at one-sixth of your sentence, or certainly one-third of your sentence. But at two-thirds, six years, out of a 10-year sentence, and then we just went through something where we were talking about two-for-one credit. Every time spent in, in pre-trial custody would count for twice. In Canada, up to three to five years for a trial. In this case, over five years, that would count as double. Lots of people walk out after their pre-trial custody, time served under this manslaughter. Anyway, I wanted to go into that dry stuff so that you have sort of a background of what's going on even Canadians aren't very sure of this, but definitely Americans, I think, will be surprised, shocked, and for once glad they're in America when we're dealing with these kinds of people, especially when you hear everything about this crime. Now, again, when I read these articles, I clipped out the newspaper art articles out of the paper, put them aside, was working with people for justice, there wasn't much going on with that. It just seemed to be, you know, the public is fairly apathetic unless something personally happens to them, it seems. Anyway, uh, someone that I knew from originally from Thunder Bay called me one day. Uh, the crime happened in July, 
and this was, say, November, early November. This person had been incarcerated for what, what ended up being charges that were dismissed. Anyway, he was in jail for a fairly short period of time, and he asked me, he called, if he could correspond with me. He was, I guess, you know, nobody wants to be inside jail whatsoever. I knew him. I felt there was no harm in letting him call me from jail. In a couple months, he called me and asked me if I could guess who was in the same cell block as he was. And lo and behold, it was Sidney Tierhus, Jack the Ripper and beyond. Now, I had my radio show, this weekly show, with, again, the open format, and with my background with People for Justice, and I am a vocal critic, I saw this as an opportunity. I asked him if he wanted to be in my radio program. Let me preface this as well. Immediately after he was arrested, and this is very unusual compared to most people, they were advised immediately not to speak to the media, this person felt it necessary to grant interviews. Like I had mentioned, I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, I can't recall anything. It seemed to me that this person was at least psychopathic in terms of, or narcissistic, whatever you want to call it, in terms of he was seeking attention. He was willing to talk. He enjoyed the focus on him. That's what I could deduce instantly. So when my friend associate or acquaintance, whatever you want to call him, when this acquaintance said to me, uh, guess who's in the cell block, I immediately said, see if he wants to be interviewed. So apparently he said, well, at some point he would. Now, I mulled this over in my mind for a few days and said, you know, I've been doing radio for a while, but I'd really like to write a book, and this issue, I think, this example of this court case, and I didn't know what to expect whatsoever, except I knew what his crime was, I knew that he was claiming he had no memory. I intuitively, or in my mind, thought it was a very interesting story. So, in a few days, I asked my friend Don to ask Sidney if he was interested in writing a book. I said I was interested in his trial and in, in his story. He got back to me sort of a day later or so and said, yes, he'd be interested. Now, I asked this gentleman to request to share a cell, if you can believe this. Share a cell with this guy, Sidney, so that they could, he could build a rapport with him, befriend him, and then begin the process of chronicling his whole life. As part of any true crime book, it's certainly not the most interesting aspect of this story for me, but I might as well get the story of his life from him. Uh, and we'll go into why that was necessary to do that, why I think it's better, and again, why it was just totally necessary anyway. So they start beginning with chronicling his life. Soon after, Sidney asked me if I'd like to come and visit him in, in jail at the remand center. I said, sure. I went to visit him. Um, it was an interesting interview. Uh, he told me a lot of things, and I thought he was—I thought he was very open for the very first time. But the main purpose of this was to begin a rapport, to to show him how you know serious I was about this book agreement to write this, and also to you know basically have an interview with him. I thought if I have more, the more interviews I have with him, the more I can get on his personality, take a take a get a good read on this person. At that first visit, however, he told me that likely they could be listening to the phone calls because you talk through telephones, through the plexiglass, in this caged visiting area at this remand center. So I certainly, he said to me that they likely could listen and, and would likely listen to conversations on the telephone. So he said for any confidential information, it would be much better much better to be written in a letter, to be communicated in a letter. Now, once upon a time in correctional centers, I have researched this, once a time in correctional centers and penitentiaries, all mail was read for anything that could be amiss, escape plans or anything, just communicating with the wrong people. There was, it was fairly strict rules. 
I was surprised that he felt confident that he could write me things in letters, confidential information. Again, at this time, I did not know how much information I could get from this killer. However, the conversation uh, I did have with the eventual cellmate, Don, who spent almost two months in the same cell as this guy in two separate times, building a rapport, building a trust, telling this person that I was the journalist that would be able to tell his story, to convey his story in its entirety. Now, Sydney then begins a correspondence with me in letters. And instead of Don writing this, Sydney writes it in his own words. He's very articulate. He's also a very illegible writer, a printer. Lots of the stuff is printed. And he is expressive writer as well. And I guess he has, you know, he saw this as a project where we would write the book together about his crimes, about the trial, about his life. And so that's what we started. And I started the correspondence in February or March of 2004. Meanwhile, this murder occurred July 1st. He went to police July 2nd, 2003. So it's not that many months after. Don Abbott is released after a few months. His charges have been dismissed. He needed a place to stay. I had a home with a couple extra bedrooms. I invited him to move in. Tried to question him about Tierhus, anything about him. He might have said four sentences. He was wanted to go to work and forget that he lived with the guy, he was with the guy. That's about all I could get out of him. I really didn't. Don Abbott was really a conduit and then facilitated the meeting between Tierhus and me, and we went together to write this book and work together. Now, for months and months, it was his whole life, his life in Vancouver, so, uh, his adventures, and, and many of these, of course, these killers are sexual addicts. These people, uh, sex and murder, um, are mixed together. So anyway, the, usually these people have a high sex drive, and at least this is what this guy boasted about. Incredible sexual adventures of this guy, men, women, anywhere, anyhow, um, and anything goes. So... He was into S&M and all kinds of things. So I had to put up with reading that material and acting like none of this stuff shocked me. And well, that wasn't so shocking. I'm really more shocked by murder, uh, dismemberment, uh, and everything that else that happened and what I eventually found out. Anyway, in this one, in subsequent months, around October or so, and I asked him for everything. I asked him, what was your conversations with your lawyer? And what I did feed upon was that he had an animosity towards the psychiatrist. He had an animosity towards the judicial system. He had an animosity towards his, his lawyer, the psychiatrist, society. And maybe he felt that was an ally and, and was going to be helpful. Or I'm not sure exactly. Like I said, I think he's articulate and intelligent, but I didn't say he wasn't foolish and, and uh, deluded. You know. So anyway, needless to say, in October... He starts sending me. He sent me letters that were much more graphic, much more detailed, incredibly disturbing. And he sent diagrams. And by the time January, well, pardon me, February or so, I had received 190 pages of letters, uh, 13, I think, or 15 diagrams. Many of those the murder diagrams, incredible, graphic, horrific. Some people talk about no remorse. This person reveled reveled and the thing that i found out in that amount amount of time as well necrophilia and again reveling in in the fact very articulate about the dismemberment again enjoying the killing gutting butchering defiling dismembering displaying this person as a human trophy as he called him a piece of meat Now, one of the issues was that the Manitoba government, you know, behind so many other states and so many other provinces, was enacting a not no profit from uh, the profits from Criminal Notoriety Act, basically not enabling 
killers, criminals, to profit from the notoriety of their crime. And they were drafting legislation. This was at the exact same time that I was corresponding with Sydney in March 2004. Now, I knew, I absolutely knew, was certain, that the law would be passed. It isn't raised to not be passed. It's an easy political thing to get through. Everybody's going to agree with it. And it was a victim's father who was pushing it, so it, it's good political stuff. It's, it's good fodder, and it's, it's, it makes political points, and, and people don't do much. So there was a talk of, of this legislation, so I knew that. Now, my sin with some people is that I offered this killer 30% of the profits. It was legal. I knew the law was going to be passed. And when the law had passed, I told the killer, hey, listen, did you hear about the law? He said, no, hung up on me. Correspondence ended, and then I went to police. I went to police with everything I had, and I became a star witness, slated to go to trial in 2006. There's a preliminary hearing. Not much happens. They just need a, a small burden of proof to be able to take it to trial. I was the star witness. Now, I'll tell you, the book features transcripts from the trial. You don't always get that. And these transcripts are incredible. That's why they're included almost, not completely, but there's a great amount of transcript, trial transcript, because this trial is incredible. Now, what's also included are the actual about 35 pages of the most horrifying, shocking, disturbing, at the same time, enlightening. Everybody talks about inside the criminal mind, inside the psychopathic mind, inside the serial killer. Now, this person fits the serial killer profile perfectly. And that pro profile says that you could not be capable of this crime at this time. That this is the last murder, not the first murder. Not the last murder. Not the first murder, the last murder. Now, if you look for murders that are similar to this, you won't find them. So... I'm not doing this trying to sell books. When you read this book, you will have read the words of one of the most heinous, horrific, and shocking killers the world has ever known. And I kid you not. If you, I kid you not. The diagrams, the words... The actual details, every graphic detail, reveling in this. Why is that important? It's not gratuitous. Because all this was deemed admissible as crucial evidence in this trial. Just to prove he had the necessary intent to kill. Unbelievably, the onus, the burden of proof was on the Crown Attorney to prove that he had the necessary intent to kill. Now, how were they going to do that? They had to discredit me, convince the jury through me again that those letters were fictional and that they were actually cumulative, that he took the stories of Jeffrey Dahmer, Dennis Nielsen, the, the British Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy, and he put the stories of those three serial killers together and created what his lawyer called fiction that he sent to me in those letters. The jury didn't believe it. Even though it was second-degree murder, they gave him 25 years before parole eligibility. So, what, the harshest sentence you can get in Canadian law. So the jury believed the killer's own words. The lawyer is defended more killers than anyone else in the English-speaking world. Fact. He's almost at 700 murder cases. And almost all of those are paid by the Canadian taxpayer. We don't have lawyers assigned to killers. They get to pick whoever they want. 
and we pay for it. And they defend these killers. They offer a very aggressive defense. Anyway, it's Trophy Kill, the Shall We Dance murder. I reveal in the book what Susan Sarandon's jewelry was in regards to the motive for this murder. You're going to have to read the book to find that out. It's You won't believe. You won't believe its role. But you get inside one of the most shocking killers in true crime history. Is he a serial killer? Read the book and you tell me. Let's see if we have any callers. And if we do, then we will see if we can connect them here and see if they've got any questions. Hello, caller? Well, I guess we don't. Okay, we don't have any callers. There we go. Anyway, this book, this started in 2003. The trial was in 2008, December 1st to the 19th. It was three weeks. I was on the stand testifying for a full day. Again, it was the defense lawyer's job to discredit me. The I, He was not successful whatsoever. You will read in this book it's that what we watch on TV and what we enjoy in fiction is, is just that, and it's very slick. When you watch Law & Order, every single word is purposeful. Every single thing is, seems strategic. It's very... Um, methodical. Well, you'll see how this isn't. You'll see how inaccurate this is, some of it. They're not even keeping track of factual information. They're confused. They're making points that are seem to be ridiculous. There'd be no purpose to making that to make any serious points. There seem to be a lot of unnecessary questioning of some of the witnesses in such a seemingly to most people an open and shut case this person should never get out of a a mental institution or he should never get out of a a jail but that's the way some people look at it however this person's psychopathic they're not insane they just have no conscience they're narcissistic again i don't really like the term so much but it's psychopathic encompasses it all of it a psychopathic killer a killer with no conscience a killer that wants to be famous a killer who has serial killers as his role models instead of giving validity which the jury didn't and the judge there's some validity to the, the notion that he took three serial killer stories and put them together except he talks about the motive he talks about the time of death he talks about the actual dismemberment and defiling of this person as it is corroborated by the pathologist and other forensic evidence. These letters that he sent me were the crucial evidence used to prosecute him successfully and sentence him to... It was reported in the paper it never happened before. He got the equivalent of a first-degree murder. In Canada... Everybody gets a parole hearing. There is something called a dangerous offender. If there are multiple sexual convictions, that could be deemed a a dangerous offender. It's very hard to get that designation, and very few criminals actually get that, despite numerous violent uh, convictions, violent crime convictions. The thing is, is that if you read this book... I don't care where you are. You're going to get a really good journey into fear on my part as well because I thought that there was a really good chance because there usually is. There is a very good 
possibility this person could have got manslaughter. It could have been dependent on me, something I did or didn't do, or didn't do right. There was so much trepidation that I had that, and the trial was delayed for two and a half years because he challenged the jury composition. He said, well, I want a jury of my peers. I'm Aboriginal, and, I, and you know, he killed an Aboriginal man who actually lived as an Aboriginal on a reserve, as opposed to he didn't. And he won in an Aboriginal tribunal. And, of course, his lawyer said, yes, with, this may change the way we select juries. However, a jury of your peers, if you look up the definition of peer, does not mean you're entitled to a jury of natives or a jury of women if you're women or a jury of black basketball players if you're a black basketball player. Peers only mean people of similar situation and circumstance in the community. That's all. So then I looked into, well, well, has this ever happened before? Well, sure, the judge that presided over it, his father presided over the same type of of jury challenge and there was six or seven other ones similar that were dismissed you know there's no belt tightening in the Canadian judicial system and the the rights that are afforded the most serious criminals are incredible and I understand the reason for it but we have a situation in in Canada where the outrage is slowly simmering we have about one-tenth the murder rate that the U.S. has. But cities like Winnipeg and Edmonton, we can compete. And some of the crimes and some of the convictions that the people would be undoubtedly convicted of murder in the U.S. are convicted of manslaughter and are out in a few years. We're talking about gang members. We're talking about serious people represented vehemently of a vehement defense by a taxpayer-paid state lawyer, a provincial lawyer, a lawyer working for the, the government, paid by the taxpayer, in a judicial system made of other lawyers, a, a district attorney, crown attorney is called in Canada, prosecuting these kinds of cases. But manslaughter is always there. Instead of first-degree murder being a fairly easy thing to achieve, it's fairly difficult. Second-degree murder, we have so many differences in Canada. If three people go to a, are intending to rob someone, and one person goes in the house and kills someone, those other people are not accessories to that murder. I just did a program last week, Carla Hamalka, Paul Bernardo, Carla Hamalka sexual assault of her sister as a wedding present to her husband. He gave her virginal sister and then was involved with three other, pardon me, two other murders, rape and murders, and then one other rape, sexual assault. She was out after 12 years on plea bargain. Depicted as a battered woman. Battered woman syndrome. Unbelievable. Anyway, that's uh, Trophy Kill, the Shall We Dance Murder, the Trial and Revelations of a Psychopathic Killer. And I, I vow this is the most shocking book you'll ever dare to read. Now, next week, we have Catherine Casey. Uh, she's written a book called Descent into Hell, true story of an altar boy, a cheerleader, and a twisted Texas murder. According to a legendary true crime author Ann Rule, she has called Catherine Casey one of the best true crime writers today. So that's a good endorsement. Uh, following week, we have someone called an author named Maura Martingale with her true crime bestseller, Cannibal Killers. Now this includes the worst, the world's most evil psychopaths, Jeffrey Dahmer, including Ed Gain, and Andre Chikatilo, uh, from the Soviet Union, I believe. And this is an incredible book as well. And she writes it from a psychological perspective. Yet it's not dry. It's just a fascinating book. And uh, that's why it's been a bestseller in, in uh, true crime categories in, in bookstores for years and years. Now, on March 3rd, after uh, Maura Martingale, we're really ramping it up in March. We have Philip Carlo, 
Now this is this is a really going to be amazing that I got this person on to talk about his book, The Night Stalker. This guy went right inside and talked to Richard Ramirez, The Life and Crimes of Richard Ramirez. New exclusive death row interview. Uh, he conducted one hell of an interview with uh, Ramirez, and it's going to be one hell of a, uh, a show. And so don't miss that. That's coming up on March 3rd. Uh, after that, we have, I might have the order change a little bit. We have a, um, an author named Stevie Cameron. This woman is a, uh, a highly respected author and investigative journalist. She's written books about uh, you know corrupt politicians, including Canada's own prime minister. Uh, and his book was called On the Take. And this person is fearless, and she felt compelled to cover the story of the Picton trial. Uh, Robert Willie Picton, uh, one of the most notorious serial killers in the world, and one of the strangest stories. If you haven't heard the story, go to Crime Library for just a taste of it, and then join me for this. Great author talking about her incredible book, The Picton Files. Now, this pig farmer from British Columbia outside Vancouver, uh, true crime fans have probably heard about this, uh, DNA connected this guy to 26 women at least found partially or completely on his farm that he owned with his brother, so that's another story, but suspected of at least 50 murders. Incredible case. Uh, lots of uh, publication bans and secrecy and... And, uh, you know, the controversy over the cops not doing anything. This guy, apparently, people have suspected this guy for years and years. Incredible. Uh, so join me for that, the Picton Files of Stevie Cameron. Now, after that, we're going to have uh, likely Sue Russell, if she's not busy. She wrote the book Lethal Intent, the story of Aileen Wuornos, uh, the notorious female hitchhiker serial killer. And Wuornos was played by Charlize Theron in the Academy Award-winning monster movie. Uh, now, Terry Sullivan is another guest that's going to be coming on. He wrote a fantastic book called Killer Clown. The, uh, he's the district attorney that investigated and helped prosecute, or did prosecute, uh, John Wayne Gacy, uh, one of the most infamous and notorious serial killers ever. After that, we have Burl Bear uh, with his incredible book called Body Account. He's considered one of the very best investigative true crime authors. Uh, second only to the, my, one of my favorites, the late, great Jack Olson. After that, we have Caitlin uh, Rother. And these are all Pinnacle authors. If you, haven't, if you haven't read some stuff from Pinnacle, it is right up there with St. Martin's Press. I actually think that Pinnacle is one of the best imprints ever from uh, Kensington Press. The great authors, great stories. Uh, it's a great, uh, great publishing company. Uh, anyway, Caitlin Ruther with her incredible book called Body Parts. And then after that, we have Linda Rosencrantz with her book called Ripper. So we've got stuff uh, and a bunch of other people coming on board after that. So I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for listening to this program, if you did enjoy it. Um, also, I wanted you to go for more information about this book if you're interested and details of when exactly it's going to come out and information how you can get your ebook right from my website go to trophykill.tv trophykill one word dot tv and check it out you will find all the information there and uh, some videos that were up actually film clips were uploaded onto youtube and and stay tuned for a couple more they're just incredible they're going to be posted in the next little while all referring you back to the website so thank you very much you've been listening to the program true murder most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them Good night.